and action. I take refuge in Jesus, Mary, all the saints, the Virgin de Guadalupe, Buddha, Krishna, Shiva, Shakti, Green Tara, Wisdom and compassion. Uh, here's the basket. The tripitaka. Tripitaka? Tripitaka. Where we have uh, some teachings. The teaching of the Buddha is called Dharma. It also means phenomena. Okay, so in this meditation session, I'm going to read and meditate upon the Dharma. Uh, but first, before doing a meditation, we should take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Uh, this is session one or two in English that I've done so far. I'm not sure what to call it. One or two, or even three. I don't know how many I've done. Maybe more, but I haven't edited them out. Okay, so this is a... Uh, Taking refuge, let's see, going for refuge. The act of going for refuge marks the point where one commits oneself to taking the Dhamma or the Buddhist teaching as the primary guide to one's life. To understand why this commitment is called a refuge, it is helpful to look at the history of the custom. In pre-Buddhist India, going for refuge meant proclaiming one's allegiance to a patron, a powerful person or a god submitting to the patron's directives in hopes of receiving protection from danger in return. So, as uh, U.S. citizens, we take refuge in the U.S. government and its president, current president, whether we like it or not. And uh, that's what we're doing. So we're submitting to the, to the directives of the U.S. government in hopes of receiving protection from danger. In return so we do that and and we're doing well uh, in doing that we're a uh, superpower <sighs> okay but in this case uh, taking refuge or going for refuge uh, would in this uh, Buddha would mean uh, a spiritual and moral uh, refuge I would say Let's see. So, let's see how does one take refuge in the Buddha. Mm. Mm. Ah. Ah, we, should, we should understand why we go for refuge. Uh, we should remember five facts, uh, which one should reflect upon often. Whether one is a woman or a man, or lay or ordained. I am subject to aging, having not gone beyond aging. I am subject to illness, have not gone beyond illness. Oh, I, I, I read it wrong. It says, I am subject to aging, have not gone beyond aging. I am subject to illness, have not gone beyond illness. I am subject to death, have not gone beyond death. I will grow different, separate from all that is dear and appealing to me. What? Oh, when it says have not gone beyond, that, uh, that kind of means that you haven't conquered them or overcome them. I am the owner of my actions. That's karma. Kama. Heir to my actions. Born of my actions. Related through my actions and have my actions as my arbitrator. Whatever I do... For good or evil, 
to that will I fall heir. So these are the five facts that one should reflect on often, whether one is a woman or a man, lay or ordained. Ordained means uh, like monk or nun. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm subject to aging. I have not gone beyond aging. So that one's a tough one because we are intoxicated with uh, youthfulness. Uh, we imagine that we're young and we try to preserve our youthful look in many ways. But we're subject to aging and we will never overcome it. Likewise, we will never overcome illness. We fall prey to cancer and the failure of our kidney and diabetes which happened to uh, poor Antonio and Coco, who are underneath me. Well, their remains. Uh, we could imagine that they're with us in our heart. That would be better. Okay, and so on. Let's see what else is interesting here. Uh, uh, this talks about the Four Noble Truths of Awakening Rule. Basically, um, It'll take a while to uh, read up, up, up on refuge. But we, uh, at the beginning of a meditation, we could say, uh, as the first thing before starting the meditation, we could say, I go for refuge to the Buddha. I go for refuge. Or you could say, I go, I pay homage, homage, homage to the Buddha. And you could replace that with Jesus Christ or whatever uh, holy being you want. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, those are the teachings of that holy being, and the Sangha. Now the Sangha is uh, those uh, people who have become followers of that holy being and have attained a, a higher uh, realizations, have, are striving to perfect themselves. and. And you could consider them the monks or nuns, priests or, or uh, bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas. They're in training to become Buddha. So we can all become Buddha, so we need training. And so you could think of these uh, Buddhist uh, books as training manuals. And this happens to be a handbook for Buddhists. And of wisdom and compassion. So keep that in mind of God. Moreover, each religion has its own studies, including conceptions, canonical languages, doctrines, symbols, rituals, spiritual practices, and social relationships. Yet many people today consider Buddhism to be a philosophy of life or a philosophy of enlightenment. This is just a personal choice. Oh, this one's interesting. What is the essential tenet of Buddhism? The essential tenet of Buddhism was taught by the Buddha in his first teaching in the Deer Park, Sarnath, which focused on the Four Noble Truths, Chatwari Aryasatyani. The truth, uh, which, uh, here's the first truth, the truth of suffering, Dukkha. Causes of suffering, what causes suffering? Cessation of suffering and that's the third one, cessation of suffering. That means that suffering can be ended, can end. And the noble path leading to the cessation of suffering. Ah, the, the fourth one is like the prescription. It's a, it's a path, so it's a journey. So uh, uh, it, it's not a pill that you take and instantaneously you uh, and all suffering, it's a, it's a struggle. Following this first Dharma teaching, the Buddha taught about non-self, i.e. no independent entity is perpetual and invariable in the existence of five human aggregates, form, feeling, feeling perception, mental formation, oh, words, 
metaphor in consciousness. Ow. In other words, nothing in either the physical or mental world can be considered an immortal self or permanent ego. In addition, speaking of the Buddhist essential tenet, it is important to remember a historical fact, namely, on the way to enlightenment, the Buddha deeply meditated on the law of Pratitya Samutpada, dependent origination, during which the Bodhisattva Siddhartha became a Buddha. Therefore, we may conclude that the essential tenet of Buddhism includes teaching of the Four Noble Truths, non self of God. Moreover, each religion has its own studies, including conceptions, canonical languages, doctrines, symbols, rituals, spiritual practices, and social relationships. Yet many people today consider Buddhism to be a philosophy of life or a philosophy of enlightenment. This is just a personal choice. Oh, this one's interesting. What is the essential tenet of Buddhism? The essential tenet of Buddhism was taught by the Buddha in his first teaching in the Deer Park, Sarnath, which focused on the Four Noble Truths, Chatwari Aryasatyani. The truth, uh, which, uh, here's the first truth, the truth of suffering, Dukkha. Causes of suffering, what causes suffering? Cessation of suffering and that's the third one cessation of suffering. That means that suffering can be ended can end and the noble path leading to the cessation of suffering uh, the, the fourth one is like the prescription It's a it's a path. So it's a journey. So uh, uh, it's not a pill that you take and instantaneously you uh, end all suffering. It's a, it's a struggle. Following this first Dharma teaching, the Buddha taught about non-self, i.e. no independent entity is perpetual and invariable in the existence of five human aggregates, form, feeling, feeling perception mental formation oh, word mental and consciousness Ow. in other words nothing in either the physical or mental world can be considered an immortal self or permanent ego in addition speaking of the Buddhist essential tenet it is important to remember a historical fact Namely, on the way to enlightenment, the Buddha deeply meditated on the law of Pratitya Samutpada, dependent origination, 